Hey. Live forever with the Lord. Praise God. Hey. All right. Let's turn to Judges chapter 9 this morning. Judges, the Old Testament, Judges chapter 9. Begin reading there. In verse number eight, Judges nine, verse eight. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou, and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble, and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for each one here today. We pray, Father, that you'll bless the preaching of the word of God. If there be somebody here today, Lord, that's not saved, doesn't know for sure if they die, they go to heaven. We pray, God, that you'd save them before it's everlasting too late. God, have your perfect will in each and every heart uh, and life, Father. We just want to thank you and praise you. You're still on the throne. You're still here and answer prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We read here in Judges chapter 9, verses 8 to 15. And this is the a parable of the trees who wanted a king. It's a parable of the trees who wanted a king. Here in Judges 9, verses 8 to 15. I want to say this morning that America is in a crisis. And the crisis concerns leadership. And the last three and a half years, I'm not trying to be a mean or a smart aleck, but uh, under Biden, the Biden-Harris administration, we haven't had much leadership, or we've had bad leadership. And I would say the same thing if it was Republicans doing the things they're doing. I, I don't care if you've got a D or an R after your name. It, it doesn't matter. But we're at the place in this country now, we got we got to save this country. It don't matter what pol political party you are. we gotta, we got to vote the right person in. I don't care if it's Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty's got the right policies. I'm voting for Humpty Dumpty. I don't care what political party uh, it is. But uh, some people are more ingrained in their political party than they are in their own Christian experience. Yeah, yeah. I'm serious. I have met Christians. They will fight you in a second over their political party. Yeah. But as far as being a born-again Christian, it isn't that big a deal to them. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. America is in a crisis and the crisis concerns leadership. We desperately need leadership. It's been said that if the gold rust, then what shall the iron do? I've been preaching a lot these last few weeks about our country and about the condition we're in because we just had July 4th recently, Independence Day. And of course, we've got an election coming up in three or four months. If those who are supposed to be in areas of leadership do not lead, then what's going to happen? What we have here in the Word of God is the story of a pitiful politician and uh, Abimelech. I don't have time to read all this here in Judges chapter 8 and chapter 9 and all this. But we have here the story of a pitiful politician and a nation in, in disarray. 
by and large, we get the kind of leadership that we deserve. Now listen to this. It's been said that wicked rulers are God's reward for wicked people. It's kind of an indictment against America. People. It's been said that wicked rulers are God's reward for wicked people. This is not a quote from the Bible, but it's a Bible truth. What's the difference between a statesman and a politician? A statesman works for the next generation. A politician works for the next election. Yeah. I want us to look at three steps in the decline of a nation. Number one, the apostasy of an unthankful people, right here in Judges. The arrogance of an ungodly leader. And the apathy of uncommitted bystanders. Number one, the apostasy of unthankful people. You'll see this. Look at chapter 8, verse 33 and 34. Judges 8, 33. It came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bareth their God. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. So this is the apostasy of unthankful people. They forgot about God. They forgot about what God had done for them. And so forth. Uh, prior to this passage, Gideon won a victory in the previous chapter. And in this, cha in this chapter, chapters 8 and 9, the people shouted, uh, blew trumpets, broke pitchers, held up the lanterns, and said, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. God put the enemy camp in disarray. There was a mighty victory. One would have thought that the people would have been so grateful that they would never again go back on God, but they turned to immorality. God had given them a wonderful victory and they forgot it. They had gone off into a fertility cult. People say this could never happen in America. We have prayed to God during times of national crisis. People went to the house of God and to seek the face of God. I'm going to tell you, and I don't want it to happen really, but what this country really needs if we're going to have revival is, I'm not going to say a depression, but we need something, some hard times when people start going back to church. Yeah. When people start seeking the face of God again. Yeah. If, they stand, if they stood in a soup line for soup and a piece of, little bread, piece of little bread, they might start becoming thankful and might start getting a little close to God. Yeah. Uh, people went to the house of God to seek the face of God. As soon as it was, o as, as, soon as, it was over, rather than giving God the praise and the glory, it seemed as though the gates of hell had been opened on us. The floodgates of filth were poured out into this land. We became blatantly immoral. Sheer apostasy happened in America. The book of Judges has an underlying uh, theme in uh, Judges 17.6. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Judges 17.6. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's the underlying theme in the book of Judges. That's why it's called Judges. It talks about the different judges and how God judged Israel. There was no fixed standard of morality. Politicians today will stand up and talk about values, but whose values? They don't know how to get a standard for values. It is morality by majority. That's what they said do. We have gone from authority to relativism. Everything is relative. There's no fixed standard. <clears throat> whatever you think is right, that's you're your own God. You just do whatever you want to do. Everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. No, the Bible is the standard. Amen. We have a government that is run by polls. Find out what people want, then give it back to them. Imagine Moses taking a poll in Egypt. Or Martin Luther taking a poll at the Reformation back in the 1500s. When I say Martin Luther, I'm not talking about Martin Luther King. I'm talking about Martin Luther back in the 1500s. Amen. Make sure you understand. Uh, that is not leadership doing that. We have gone from truth to pragmatism. No longer do we ask, is it true? We ask, does it work? People choose religion to produce health, wealth, and happiness. It is a man-centered rather than God-centered. We have gone from revelation to feeling. Psychology has been substituted for theology. Instead of theology, it is me-ology. Me. 
Sin is no longer the enemy, but sorrow and sadness are the enemy. To feel good about yourself is the number one priority in most people's lives in America. I just want to feel good about myself. Well, there's a lot of wicked things that might make you feel good about yourself. Yeah. Don't mean it's right. We have gone from convictions to opinions. Few people have convictions about anything except their right to be happy. You don't have a right to, for anything. You and I have a right to go to hell and burn forever. That was our right. Yeah. We don't have no rights. If you're saved, the only right you have is that to your creator. Yeah. And if you're unsaved, you need to get saved and serve God. Amen. Amen. This is being played out in the government today. In the 1960s, the courts ruled that it is unconstitutional for a student in a public school to pray out loud and for students to arrive at school early to hear a student volunteer to read prayers. The First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof. When the first United States Congress passed the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights, at the same time they passed the Northwest Ordinance. Northwest Ordinance. Historians tell us that it is among the fourth most important documents in our national history, along with the Articles of Confederation, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution. It says religion, it says, quote, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools, and means of education shall forever be encouraged, unquote. Religion, morality, and knowledge are necessary to good government. Not only has the religion become apostate and the revisionist remodeled our constitution, but the media moguls are also systematically seducing our children. They have normalized that which is abnormal and subnormal. A lot of our young people today, they think that the abnormal is the right thing. And they think that the normal is the wrong thing. A physical, intimate relationship between unmarried couples is seen as normal. <coughs> Profanity and filth are known as polite conversation. They have desensitized us. Desensitized us. Things don't shock us anymore. You know what Ephesians 4, uh, 4 uh, 18 or 19, uh, it says, uh, being past feeling. Talks about people being past feeling in Ephesians 4, 18 and 19. Being past feeling. That means you can pinch your flesh, pinch yourself. You don't feel nothing anymore. You're desensitized. You're past feeling. A lot of people in America are past feeling. What used to amaze us now amuses us. We have a generation today that doesn't know how to blush or flinch. They have legitimized the illegitimate. Sexual perversion has gone from a sin to a sickness to a socially accepted practice. They have legitimized the things that God calls sin. They have stigmatized that which is good, decent, and godly. The word virgin is laughed at by a lot of people in America. As a matter of fact, if a man or a woman, a young man or young woman is a virgin, by the time they're 18, 21 years old, they're looked at and laughed at by their so-called friends and acquaintances. Like they're some oddball weirdo nerd. I'm telling the truth this morning. Amen. Amen. Monogamous marriage is a joke. In America today. Those who stand up for Bible truth are called a part of the radical religious right. Not only by the left wing God hate and reprobate go to hell burn forever news media but by many others. Those who stand up for what is right are now no longer tolerated. They're stigmatized. As a matter of fact if you tell what the truth and a lot of times you're thrown off of the social media channel. But you're allowed to get on there and talk about perversion. Yeah. 
They're stigmatized. They are looked upon as a threat to society. Born-again Bible-believing people that stand for truth are looked upon as a threat to society. A threat to society. Uh, it, it matches Isaiah 5.20, which says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's Isaiah 5, verse 20. That's America. That's America in the last 50 years. You say, well, what do we do? Everybody, yeah, you're up here talking about what do we do? We, we get right with God. We get saved. We get right with God. We rededicate our lives to God. We pray for our nation, and we live according to the Word of God, and we witness and pass out tracts and invite people to church and try to get people saved because the Lord's coming back. Yeah. A former congressman once said the following. Listen to this. When children grow up in homes without a father's discipline and love and without a mother's nurture and comfort, we consign a young generation to problems they have not created and do not deserve. Say it again. Former congressman once said the following. When children grow up in homes without a father's discipline and love and without a mother's nurture and comfort, what we're doing is we're consigning that young generation to problems they have not created and they do not deserve. Look at Judges chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. Judges 8, verse 16. And he took the elders of the city, this is Gideon, and thorns of the wilderness and briars, by the way, that's what bramble is. Bramble is thorns and briars. Thorns of the wilderness and briars. And with them he taught. He, he taught the men of Sukkoth. Uh, he's teaching them a lesson. Verse 17. And he beat down the tower of Penuel and slew the men of the city. What's, what is this? This sheds some light on the New Testament Ephesians 6, 4, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Uh, the guy says here, the Hebrew word here means uh, this taught them, and Judges 8, 16, he taught them, Gideon taught them. He said the Hebrew word here means causing to know something or education. Thus, the word in the New Testament refers to chastening, not just instruction. When he taught them, it wasn't just instruction. It was uh, chastening. Gideon is teaching, you might say, reading, writing, and arithmetic. In other words, he's whooping their backside. Yeah. To the tune of a hickory stick. All right? In this case, thorns and briars. This means you now have two generations of Americans who did not learn anything growing up, or learn the main things. They never learned that disobedience brings suffering and pain. This explains why America has the largest jail population of any country in the United Nations. Amen. He taught him. Well, Gideon taught him. Sure did. Got him a big stick. He taught the men of Succoth. All right, it's kind of tongue in cheek things. Teaching them a lesson. You see that? That's what he's doing there. All right. America without a foundation of stable families is an America built on shifting sand. When we accept the denigration of religious freedom, we compromise the means of our deliverance. We believe in a free church and a free state, but that freedom of religion does not mean freedom from religion. We as a nation were conceived in faith, founded on faith, and prospered through faith. Number two, the arrogance of an ungodly leader. You'll find that here in Judges chapter 9, verses 1 to 6, which we did not read. We started reading in verse 8 for our text. 
but we'll kind of go through it here. There arose an ungodly leader named Abimelech. Look at Judges 9, verse 1. And Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it's better for you, either that all the sons of Jerubbabel, which are threescore and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. Abimelech was a bramble. By the way, I don't know if I gave the title of my message. The title of my message is Thorns in a Nation's Side. That's what bramble is. Thorns and thistles. It's also mentioned back in Genesis 3.18 after Adam and Eve sinned that thorns and thistles shall the ground bring unto thee. Bramble. Bimelech was a bramble. I'm not trying to be mean, but we've had a bramble in the White House the last three and a half years. Amen. Amen. You can get mad if you want to. That's all right. He was a thorn bush, Abimelech was. He had an unholy ambition to lead the country. Abimelech built a coalition here in chapter 9 of Judges, verses 1 and 2. He, we just read it. He went to his friends back where he was raised. He told them that he was one of them, verses 1 and 2. And then in verses 3 and 4, he buys his constituents. He buys them. Let's read Judges 9, verse 3. And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, all these words, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, He is our brother. Verse 4, And they gave him threescore and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Belbereth, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons, which followed him. Paying them off, baby. Paying them off. Baal Bareth was the god of sexual immorality. That's what it's talking about there in verse 4 when it says he hired vain and light persons. They're wicked, ungodly people. Baal Bareth was the god of sexual immorality. This was a slap in the face of the god of Israel because the money came from the house of Baal Bareth. You know, sometimes an election can be bought. Sometimes an election can be stolen or rigged. About a shout around the aisles on that one. Are you making the parallel? Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Abimelech brutalized his competition. <clears throat> Judges 9, verse 5, he's a bloody man. Look at verse 5. He went unto his father's house in Orpah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubbabel, being three score and ten persons. I mean, they'll kill you, man. <laughs> this leader right here, he'll kill you, buddy. Put a bullet, he'll, put, he'll try to put a bullet in your head. <laughs> Say amen right there. Being three score and ten persons upon one stone, notwithstanding yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left, for he hid himself. He hides himself, so he, he escapes. So this Abimelech's a bloody man. In today's world, governments can still be built on blood, the blood of innocent little babies, abortion, whatever. Habakkuk 2.12, Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establisheth a city by iniquity. If we were to build a memorial for the little babies who have died since Roe versus Wade, it would have millions of names on it. Abortion, homosexuality, lesbianism, defund the police, open borders, do away with the pipelines so we can't be energy independent. Who in the, heck, who in the world would vote for somebody like that? He said, preacher, man. I can't believe you're sin. Don't you, don't, aren't you worried about what? I ain't worried about nothing. Amen. I've been on this thing, I've been on this road too long to worry and start worrying now. Amen. Hey, we're at, we're at the crossroads. You know what this November 5 will tell me? Whether God is done with America. Yeah. Yeah. It'll tell me if God's done with America or not. Yeah. 
If there are some who have had abortions unknowingly, unwittingly, and out of fear or ignorance. I understand that. And there's a God of grace and forgiveness. Someone needs to speak up for the unborn. Abimelech had himself inaugurated with a show of religion. I here recently says he's not going to re run for re-election, but he's still the president. And the left-wing news media is on Trump because he says he ain't going to he ain't going to debate Harris. Well, Harris ain't the president. <laughs> She's still the vice president, isn't she? And Joe Biden's still the president. Well, J.D. Vance needs to debate Harris. But they'll conjure up anything they can. Anything, they, any lie, any misconstruing, they can. That's all they got to work. They can't go on policies. Bunch of stinking liars, man. Bunch of stinking liars. Abimelech uh, had himself inaugurated with a show of religion. Verse 6 here, Judges 9, verse 6. Most believe this is where God spoke to Abraham and gave him the covenant. There, there in that place, Abimelech tried to associate himself with things that were good and holy. And he made a farce of the whole thing. In verse 6, 9, 6, And all the men of Shechem gathered together in all the house of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. So forth and so on. Last of all, number three. The apathy of uncommitted bystanders. Verses 7 to 15, which we read. Oh, we didn't read verse 7. We read verses 8 to 15. There's a prophet named Jotham in verse 7. Listen to God's word if you want God to listen to your word. Verse 7 says, And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Ger Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. He said, Hearken unto me, that God may hearken unto you. You see that? He said, listen to God's word if you want God to listen to your word. Proverbs 28, verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. And then verse 8 to 15 in our text, Jotham told a parable about trees that wanted a king. Now listen, I'm almost done. The trees asked the olive tree in verse 8 to reign over them. But the olive tree was too busy prodding fatness in verse 9. That's a national necessity. Well, things we need, necessities. Then the trees asked the fig, tr fig tree in verse 10 to reign over them. But the fig tree was too busy producing figs with their sweetness in verse 11. That may not be a necessity, but that is a nicety. Necessities and then niceties in verse 12. And then in verse 13, the trees then asked the vine to rule over them in verse 12. The vine was too busy producing wine to cheer the heart of man and God in verse 13. That was a luxury. So these trees were all so busy with their necessities, niceties, and their luxuries that the trees went to the bramble. We've gone to the bramble. Getting the gist of the story here? Yeah. Pretty simple, isn't it? Yeah. They were all so busy with their necessities and their niceties and their luxuries that the trees went to the bramble. The bramble was glad to rule over them and control them, have power over them. The bramble has no fruit, no shade, and no lumber. The bramble rips shreds, chokes, clings, and grows. It's very hard to remove. They all fled their responsibilities and let the bramble rule. It's been said that all that's necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. In closing, the book of Judges shows that God would rather forgive than judge. He's a God of mercy, thank God. We must disabuse ourselves of the idea that there could be no revival, no restoration. There can be. I don't know about national revival, but 
I'd like to see it, but there can be personal revival and there can be church revival. We got to get rid of the bramble. Bramble rips and shreds and chokes and clings and grows. It's very hard to remove. Let me tell you something. This administration we got now, if you think they're done doing all their shenanigans and all their little things, there'll probably be a September and October surprises. And I hope Donald Trump has a lot of secret service around him. And if he becomes president, he voted in on November 5th, I hope the next four years he has a lot of secret service around him. Yep. Yeah. Let's stand.